I'm Christy Schreiber, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Schreiber, and this is the How to Love Live podcast. This week, we are starting an important memoir, um, a story from across the Atlantic Ocean, far from our home here in Tennessee. And this book has been important in this century, so important, in fact, that Amazon has put it on the top row of its list of 100 books everyone should read in their lifetime. Uh, it is jarring, it is disturbing, but it brings awareness to a crisis that no resident on planet Earth should ignore. A Long Way Gone by Ishmael Bea takes us with him through his journey from innocence to the violence of being a child soldier at the age of 12 and on to the tumultuous uh, repatriation of a recovering victim of this crime against humanity. Yes, and we will take three episodes to discuss uh, the context of the war in Sierra Leone and uh, the larger picture that was totally unknown to Bea while he was living through it. In episode one, you know, we'll do our best to discuss the complicated factors that led up to the war in Sierra Leone, as well as the first nine chapters of the book. In episode two, we'll discuss chapters 10 through 15, as Bea recounts various important events that marked his years as a soldier, as well as the situation of child soldiers around the world today. And finally, in the last episode, we'll talk about not only the end of the war for Bea, because he's fortunate enough to escape and has managed to rebuild a new life for himself, but also the end of the war for Sierra Leone as the country and what has happened to this beautiful war-ravaged place since the events that we read about in the memoir. I think for many of us, uh, we need a brief overview of the country in general. So let's talk about that first. Uh, then we'll start with the details of the war. Uh, absolutely. You know, Sierra Leone is in West Africa. Now, we talked about West Africa when we discussed Nigeria and things fall apart. But when you compare Nigeria to Sierra Leone, there are a lot of differences, even though they're both on the western side of the African continent. But where Sierra Leone is uh, little, Nigeria is big, and both in population but also in space. Nigeria has, uh, for example, 214 million people, and Sierra Leone only has 7 million. Uh, Sierra Leone covers you know, 71,000 square kilometers, but Nigeria covers 923,000 more than that thousand yeah. or square kilometers. So you can see, you know, these are big differences. Another thing to notice uh, is that it's on the coast, which means it was heavily involved in the African slave trade before that was outlawed in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, you know, but it, it perpetuated illegally even far after that. Its neighbor to the north and east is Guinea, which is a small country too, although larger than Sierra Leone. It has around 10 million people, uh, where its neighbor to the south is Liberia and is slightly smaller. Liberia, uh, many Americans have heard of it because uh, it is Africa's first and oldest republic. It was started by freed African-American slaves in the middle of the 19th century. Um, its capital, Monrovia, was named after the American president, James Monroe. And However, the relationship between the African-American transplants and the indigenous people both in Sierra Leone as well as Liberia, has always been complicated. And Liberia has also struggled tremendously with civil unrest and war and then, of course, the Ebola virus. And we will see that many of the problems in Sierra Leone have a direct connection to the problems in Liberia. And, of course, this is presented to us, uh, you know, in the first page of the story as Ismael Bea sets up our introduction to his unexpected entrance into the war. He opens his story two years before the chaos really came into his life. He starts the story when he's 10 years old. He recalls refugees passing through his village after having walked hundreds of miles, and they're telling stories about their families being murdered. And 
he thinks that they're embellishing the events of their lives. It kind of reminds me of Ellie Wiesel's experience when he introduces the, his story of the Holocaust by saying that they'd heard rumors of the atrocities of Auschwitz, and those were dismissed as embellishments or complete fabrications. But let's read Bea's word in this case as he describes what he thought at the time when refugees fled into his village. So let me read what he says. He says this, The adults among these children from the war zones would be lost in their thoughts during conversations with the elders of my town. Apart from their fatigue and malnourishment, it was evident they had seen something that plagued their minds, something that we would refuse to accept if they told us at all. At times, I thought some of their stories the passersby told were exaggerated. The only wars I knew of were those that I had read about in books or seen in movies such as Rambo, First Blood, and the one in neighboring Liberia that I had heard about on the BBC News. My imagination at 10 years old didn't have the capacity to grasp what had taken away the happiness of these refugees. Well, of course, uh, you know, my imagination at my age cannot imagine this either. No. <laughs> uh, this is one of the most important takeaways of the book. We cannot imagine, even after reading a book, uh, it, you know, if we're lucky enough to have lived in peaceful countries, we cannot imagine anything that we will read in this book that was really someone's lived experience. Uh, but we have to understand it. Um, the introduction that Bea writes to this book completely demonstrates our inability to grasp the story that he is about to tell us. I agree. So let's go back and let's read that introduction. If you read the part for Bea, I'll read uh, The American Teenagers. Okay. My high school friends have begun to suspect I haven't told them the full story of my life. Why did you leave Sierra Leone? Because there is a war. Did you witness some of the fighting? Everyone in the country did. You mean you saw people running around with guns and shooting each other? Yes, all the time. Cool. I smile a little. You should tell us about it sometime. Yes, sometime. <laughs> you know, and so with this introduction, we open the pages to a story that none of us living outside of, of that reality could ever imagine. We will let Bea tell us something about it. As he says, we can't imagine it by looking at pictures of Sierra Leone either. I mean, Sierra Leone is a beautiful country. It's full of mountains, and it has lush green fields. There's palm trees. There's beautiful beaches. When you see pictures of the people, they're naturally a very joyful people. And if you watch videos from documentarians, you'll see children laughing and singing and dancing every time they're on camera. You know, the history is rich. It's interesting, and it's very promising at its origins. One thing I think is even interesting to note is the name, Sierra Leone. That name dates back to 1462 when a Portuguese explorer sailed down the coast and he called it the Sierra Leoa or Lion Mountains. Some people say he called it because the mountains look like lion's teeth. Others say he called it because there were many thunderstorms and the place sounded like a roaring of a lion. I don't guess it really matters. Either way, the British officially adopted the name Sierra Leone in 1787 for that reason, and it's been called that ever since. The capital is named Freetown, and it has an important history as well. And Land for the city was purchased by local chiefs in the late 1700s to be a home for resettled slaves, uh, mostly from Britain, many of whom had earned their freedom by fighting for the British in the American Revolution, uh, as well as other former slaves from South America um, or, you know, recaptives had taken off sea slave ships. Uh, if you remember, the British passed the abolition of the Slave Trade Act in 1807, but it continued illegally after that. And the most famous story of escaped slaves from Sierra Leone, of course, is the story of the Amistad from 1839, uh, which brought this issue to the Supreme Court of the United States as captive slaves argued for their freedom. And uh, there's a very good movie uh, that carries that name and tells a story. And today, when you go to Freetown, one thing you will be sure to see is the huge tree called the Cotton Tree. It's Freetown's most important landmark. And, and when we get to the end of the book, when Bea is leaving Freetown, 
to set out on his own for Guinea and hopefully America, we see it referenced. I mean, it's an it's important because the whole town of Freetown was built around this tree when the repatriated settlers from the outside first arrived. So it's not only a landmark, but it's a symbol of the country and it's even on their currency. You know, Sierra Leone, even though I said it's it's really small relatively, is home to 16 different ethnic groups. Now, here in the United States, you know, that's kind of difficult for us to really visualize. Well, let me try to put this into context. Um, if you're in America, Sierra Leone is about the same size as North Carolina. If you're in Europe, uh, Sierra Leone is about the same size as Ireland. And uh, so think of that land space, but with 16 different people groups with different languages and ethnic heritages all mixed in one spot. Hopefully that helps a little. Uh, well, for sure. And, and we'll see a few of them referenced in the book. You know, the largest is the Mende, and we see that name for sure pretty quickly. It's used both as a people group, but he also references it as a language group. The second largest is the Timne, and, and those are mostly in the north, so we'll run into that name a little bit later on in the story. Freetown, we'll see that name in the story. It's in the west, and it's home of the Creole which is the name given to the settlers who came from Sierra Leone, from Europe or other places. Uh, they were uh, black, but not native to Africa. So all three of these names, you know, we're going to see them referenced in different places in the story. Uh, it's important when we learn about a country, obviously, to be familiar with the big and influential people groups. But I also want to point out that even though English is the official language of Sierra Leone, it's used mostly by the literate minority, not the majority of the people who live in the country. Creo, that's the language group uh, originally from the people around Freetown, but it's the unifying factor among the different groups, and it's spoken by most people there. You know, when I started reading Chapter 1, I expected to see Bea reference his home tribe and native language, but he doesn't. In fact, he doesn't mention his cultural heritage directly at all. Um, he introduces us to himself and his friends by showing us a bunch of boys listening to American rap music, you know, names that we're all familiar with, uh, Naughty by Nature, LL Cool J, Run DMC, Heavy D and the Boys, you know, all those ones <laughs> you, you had on a mixtape when you were in high school, right? Well, I mean, it's interesting, and I think it perhaps a testimony to how none of the conflict that we will read about had anything to do with ethnicity. And, and most of us would have assumed that that would be the case. We think of conflicts in the West having to do with race or religion, maybe kind of like the problems in Ireland or, or maybe like the ones in the Middle East. But in Sierra Leone, that is absolutely not the case. This is not a tribal conflict. This is not about ethnic cleansing. No, it isn't. And religion does not seem to be divisive when we read about Sierra Leone in textbooks, and Bea doesn't portray it as divisive either. And Bea's family is a religious family. They're Muslim. Uh, but this war is not about Islam versus Christianity. Uh, we will see several religious traditions of Sierra Leone expressed in a book. But we will not see antagonism between the religious segments that Bea references. And in case you are wondering about the religious makeup of the people in Sierra Leone, it's estimated that in Sierra Leone, uh, between 50 to 70 percent of the people are animists, meaning that they follow uh, traditional religious beliefs. 25 to 40 percent adhere to Islam and around 5 percent are Christian, most of those being Creo. You know, now, if you uh, add that up, you know that you get more than 100%, right? <laughs> well, you are bad at math. Well, indeed. And that means that many people practice Islam and Christianity, but also practice traditional beliefs all at the same time. So I want to reiterate, because it's important to understand that, that neither religion nor ethnicity play a role in the civil strife that we are reading about, which is really a common misconception. And so, you know, our story starts with Ishmael and his brother, Junior, a few boys, walking 16 miles to go into a town by the name of Matrajong away from their village. Of course, this seems strange to people who grew up in a place like Memphis because here we drive everywhere. Or in a big city like Bello, uh, where I grew up, students would ride a bus in a situation like this. But we can clearly see from the context of our story 
that walking was not unsafe and doesn't seem uncommon. The boys stop at their grandmother's house. They have slingshots. They target monkeys, which, you know, it's not very nice, but something I can see a lot of. <laughs> boy stuff. <laughs> yeah. They stop to swim. They practice their rap routines. We were painted a picture of normal adolescent boys living a normal adolescent life in a very safe cultural context until all of a sudden a world conflict descends upon them just out of the blue. Gary, when I read this, I had no idea what was happening, and it seems that these boys did not either. What is happening? Oh, for sure. I mean, and, and this is why reading things like memoirs are, is so important. When we read what happened in Sierra Leone in a textbook, we see that there's a government in Freetown that is corrupt. A group of insurgents rise against them, and it all seems kind of distant and complicated and sterile. And it's full of acronyms like uh, the SLPP and the, and the APC and the RUF, but uh, war is not sterile. I mean, it's dirty and brutal and more brutal than we can understand from a textbook, you know. But here's the overview. Sierra Leone became independent on April 27, 1961, as a constitutional monarchy. The next year, they had an election. The Sierra Leonean People's Party was elected to govern. Uh, this party stayed in power until the next election in 1967. At this time, the left-leaning party won, and the name of this new party was the All People's Congress, um, or APC. There was a military coup to prevent them from taking power. There was a counter coup to put them back in power, and it's all very complicated. But the end result was that the APC, uh, under the leadership of a man by the name of Dr. Siaka Stevens, ran a one-party government all the way until the 1980s. And by the 80s, uh, the government's plagued with allegations of corruption and economic instability and just a host of other problems. And civil workers were not being paid their wages from the government. And before independence from Britain, Sierra Leone had good schools. And in fact, Fora Bay College in Freetown had an excellent reputation. It was considered a premier academic institution for all of Africa. By 1985, under the presidency of Dr. Stevens, all of that was gone. In 1985, Sierra Leone had the lowest adult literacy rate of the 160 countries on the United Nations Human Development Report. They were dead last. The overwhelming majority of youth had grown up with no education and had no opportunity to support themselves. Well, uh, you can say that in Sierra Leone, by the time the RUF came around, I mean, these people have reason to be very disgruntled with their political leadership. I mean, people are disenfranchised. Schools aren't funded. I mean, Sierra Leone has all these minerals and natural resources that are actually being mined. But all the profits are being taken from the top corrupt government officials, leaving everyone who lives in this place undereducated, underemployed, with no public services in most of the country. I mean, there's no way to describe the situation in Sierra Leone at the time that this happened as anything except horrendously bad. Uh, Bea's father calls it rotten politics, which <laughs> seems a little bit like an understatement. You say there's a variety? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, well, you know, it, it, and so it should uh, be a surprise to no one to see that in March of 1991, a man by the name of Fode Sanko led an insurrection. His group is called the Revolutionary United Front, or as Bea references it in his book, the RUF. They were promising as all rebel groups do to change the situation. Uh, they were claiming they were going to get a hold of the country's vast diamond mines and make sure everyone got their fair share. You know, this is the message everyone wanted to hear. It's the message we hear from everybody when they take over <laughs> <That's> things. <right. laughs> the RUF, and we see this in Bay's account, did seize the diamond mines, but they used them not to support humanitarian efforts but to fund a revolution against the Sierra Leone National Army. Uh, the diamonds that came out of the mines have been called blood diamonds. Many of them left Sierra Leone through the country of Liberia, through the hands of the dictator of Liberia, Charles Taylor. There's another story. 
who since this time has been tried and convicted to a 50-year sentence for war crimes against humanity, you know, associated with what he did to children in Sierra Leone during the Civil War. Yeah, I I have heard of that name, uh, Charles Taylor. And I also kind of remember there's a story that involves him and the supermodel Naomi Naomi Campbell. Didn't he give her some of these blood diamonds? (laughs) Oh, yes. It was a terrible scandal. Uh, Charles Taylor met Naomi Campbell, uh, the American supermodel, if you aren't familiar with that name, in 1997 at an event in South Africa honoring Nelson Mandela. And he ironic. Ga- yes, and he gave her some diamonds from uh, these mines in Sierra Leone. And Campbell very publicly had to testify in court that she had been a recipient of these. And apparently Taylor literally had mayonnaise jars full of diamonds that he would transport out of Sierra Leone and sell to arms dealers in exchange for guns and ammunition uh, that he put in the hands of children. And the war in Sierra Leone has been considered one of the most brutal wars in the history of our planet. Taylor was responsible for more uh, than what we read about in Bayes' account. He murdered and mutilated civilians. He used women and girls as sex slaves. He abducted children and adults to perform forced labor in the mines. He drugged children uh, and enticed or forced them to serve as soldiers. And all of this was um, in function of getting his hands on these diamonds in Sierra Leone. And by the end of the 10-year conflict, over 120,000 people would be dead. But the RUF rebels, you know, they mutilated thousands more civilians that had nothing to do with the conflict. Um, They would sever hands and arms as a regular practice. And Taylor put in place a system that terrorized and controlled the people of Sierra Leone. And uh, this is what historians would call a warlord insurgency. It wasn't a religious war. It wasn't ethnically motivated. It wasn't really even a civil war like we generally think of. I mean, the entire conflict in Sierra Leone was politically and economically motivated. I mean, everyone wants diamonds. And a third of the population of Sierra Leone was displaced because of it. I mean, this seems incredibly difficult to imagine and think possible. And I guess this is why the first chapter of this book expresses complete shock that it's actually happening. I mean, even the people living near the mines didn't see this coming. He references the mines. Bear recalls life three days before the assault. It's just absolutely average. He's consumed with the kind of things that we're all consumed with. His parents were divorced, and they had problems with a stepmother. He had problems with school. He's learning rap music. They have money problems. And, of course, these are all real problems, things that we all struggle with no matter where we live in the world, and yet they are nothing compared to the horrors he will describe. You know, after my students read this part of the book in class this year on a quiz over this section, I asked them to recount which anecdote most affected them. Almost all of them referenced the anecdote where Bea recounts a mother running from gunfire with a baby on her back, and she's saved. Her life is saved because the bullet is absorbed in the body of the baby. It's a terrifying story, and of course, it's something that stands out as an atrocity that no mother could bear to survive. But it isn't the only atrocity Bea describes he witnesses being done by the RUF. There are many atrocities, and he can't understand why are they gratuitously just murdering people with no connection to anything. He asks this, and I quote him, What kind of liberation movement shoots innocent civilians, children, that little girl? There wasn't anyone to answer these questions, and my head felt heavy with the images it contained. He describes the RUF sending a messenger to Matru Drong from another village that the RUF RUF had ransacked. The messenger had RUF carved on his body with a bayonet, and all of his fingers, except his thumb, had been chopped off. The rebels called this type of mutilation one love, ironically, because people in Sierra Leone had adopted that expression, the expression one love as a greeting between each other where they would raise their thumbs and say one love when they would meet. To Bea, and really to readers of this book, it just doesn't make sense. What are the rebels, what is the RUF doing? 
Um, you know, it's really very simple. They are taking over those mining districts. And in the first year of the war, the RUF took almost all of the mining areas and they controlled one fifth of the country in the southeast region. And they were mining those alluvial diamonds. So what's an alluvial diamond? Oh, yeah, good question there. You ready for some, uh, some geology? Geology? Huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, alluvial diamond is an above-ground mining technique. It's done manually by workers who are given a spade and a sieve, and they sift riverbeds or areas of silt looking for diamonds. And it's extremely labor-intensive, and uh, you can see why they want forced labor. But in Sierra Leone, it yields. Um, and one of the most famous diamonds was discovered in Sierra Leone in February of 1972. Are you ready for this? Okay. 969 carats. That's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's only been exceeded in size by two other diamonds found underground, and they called it the star of Sierra Leone. I can see why. Yeah. Um, you know, alluvial diamond mining is highly unregulated, and it can be very destructive to the environment. Um, companies, or in this case, the RUF, would often use mercury to extract rough diamonds from the kimberlite. And, of course, you know, mercury seeps into the ground. It contaminates drinking water. It kills fish and other animals. And uh, the miners can dig gigantic holes up to 30 feet deep, uh, making large places kind of look like the surface of the moon and after the miners leave uh, the wildlife is destroyed the land is unsuitable anymore for farming and sometimes the entire ecosystem just collapses uh well in this case ismael and junior Bea, along with their friends are forced to run immediately they are the exact demographic that the ruf is looking for and they know it we know for a fact that half of the RUF fighters at that time were ages 8 to 14. And that's not counting, you know, the students or the children who were enslaved to work as minors. Uh, yes, but don't think the RUF is the only one uh, doing this. At the time the war broke out, there were around 3,000 soldiers in the official Sierra Leone Army. Uh, that is not the RUF number. That's the number of government soldiers. That number would swell to 16,000, and over 4,000 of those would be under the age of 14. I mean, all in all, it's estimated that uh, anywhere from 10,000 to 14,000 children were fighters in this war. Man, that's crazy. And, you know, by Chapter 5, Ismael and Junior have been caught. How could you ever, you know, successfully run? They're caught by RUF rebels. The rebels need recruits. They've lined up all these boys, and they're performing a selection. Again, very similar to what we read from Ellie Wiesel. The Nazis did the same thing. And let's read what they say. This is what the RUF fighters said. We want strong recruits, not weak ones. The rebel pushed us back to the other side of the crowd. Junior edged next to me, and he gave me a soft poke. I looked up at him, and he nodded and rubbed my head. Stand still for the final pick, one of the rebels screamed. Junior stopped rubbing my head. During the second pick, Junior was chosen. The rest of us weren't needed, so they escorted us to the river, followed by the chosen ones. Sweeping an arm in our direction, one of the rebels announced, we are going to initiate all of you by killing these people in front of you. We have to do this to show your blood and make you strong. You'll never see any of these people again unless you believe in life after death. He punched his chest with his fist and laughed. I turned around and looked at Junior, whose eyes were red because he was trying to hold back his tears. He clenched his fist to keep his hands from trembling. I began to cry quietly and all of a sudden felt dizzy. One of the chosen boys vomited. A rebel pushed him to join us by smashing him in the face with the butt of his gun. The boy's face was bleeding as we continued on. Don't worry, guys. The next killing is on you, another rebel commented and laughed. Well, what we notice in this passage, besides the terror and brutality, is that the Bea boys cry, which, you know, that doesn't seem unusual to us. It, it's normal. But what we're going to see at work in the book is that this humanity will be taken from Bea. As we read the second section of the book, Bea will, will no longer cry. He will have lost his humanity entirely. 
Uh, no, but not yet. Um, Junior and Ishmael escape this band of rebels, and they're on the run, and they run with no real direction. They just run away. And we see compassion, you know, in their interactions with so many strangers. You know, different communities take them in. I mean, and many of these communities are scared to death, as they should be. I mean, here are five young boys roaming the countryside, and, and we just read what young boys were doing. Uh these boys are in a no-win situation. Everywhere they go, there are rebels ransacking villages, murdering people, seizing recruits. And at one point, Ishmael Bea finds himself completely alone in the jungle. He spends days with no contact with any humanity of any kind. He almost gets killed by a wild boar because you, you have to think about this is in Africa. By the end of chapter 9, Bea is ready to be caught He has run with his brother. He has run alone. He has run with a group of boys that he just met. He is caught by a group of villagers that are just simply trying to protect their own village from mercenaries or rebels. Uh, On Bea's body, they find a cassette tape. Bea's music will save his life over and over again in this book. And the time when he's caught by these people protecting their village uh, is no exception. Let's read how this unfolds. Now, you show me how you, your brother, and friends did it, the chief said. I rewound the tape, mimed and danced to OPP, barefoot in the sand. I didn't enjoy it, and for the first time I found myself thinking about the words of the song, closely listening to the subtle instruments in the beat. I had never done such a thing before because I knew the words by heart and I felt the beat. I didn't feel it this time. As I hopped up and down, hunched and raising my arms and feet to the music, I thought about being thrown into the ocean, about how difficult it would be to know that death was inevitable. The wrinkles on the chief's forehead began to ease. He still didn't smile, but he gave a sigh that said, I was just a child. At the end of the song, he rubbed his beard and said that he was impressed with my dancing and found the singing interesting. He asked for the next cassette to be played. It was LL Cool J. (laughs) I mimed the song, I Need Love. So he goes on to let the boys go. Bea laughs to avoid crying, but we can see he's still very much a part of humanity, struggling to keep his humanity, and it won't be much longer until that part of him will be completely dead. You know, uh, Bea survives the war. We know this because he writes the memoir. We know this because even in Chapter 2, he references being in New York City and dreaming. We're left to imagine how did this kid possibly survive this? How did he escape? As Bea weaves his tale, one of my favorite things is that he incorporates flashbacks of memories. Some are terrible, but a few are beautiful. And I want to end our podcast today with a beautiful one. I, like many of us, um, love the moon. I love full moons. I love bright moons. I love big moons. At the end of chapter one, Bea recounts an incident with his grandmother. I want us to end our episode today thinking about the wisdom from Kabadi Sierra Leone uh, that we would do well to embed just as Bea has into our lives. Let's read it. We must strive to be like the moon. An old man in Kabadi repeated the sentence often to people who walked past his house on their way to the river to fetch water, to hunt, to tap palm wine, and to their farms. I remember asking my grandmother what the old man meant. She explained that the adage served to remind people to always be on their best behavior and to be good to others. She said that people complain when there is too much sun and it gets unbearably hot, and also when it rains too much or when it is cold. But, she said, no one grumbles when the moon shines. Everyone becomes happy and appreciates the moon in their own special way. Children watch their shadows and play in its light. People gather at the square to tell stories and dance through the night. A lot of happy things happen when the moon shines. There are some of the reasons why we should want to be like the moon. You look hungry. I will fix you some cassava. She ended the discussion. After my grandmother told me why we would strive to be like the moon, I took it upon myself to closely observe it. Each night when the moon appeared in the sky... I would lie on the ground outside and quietly watch it. I wanted to find out why it was so appealing and likable. I became fascinated with the different shapes that I saw inside the moon. Some nights I saw the head of a man. 
He had a medium beard and wore a sailor's hat. Other times I saw a man with an axe chopping wood, and sometimes a woman cradling a baby at her breast. Whenever I get a chance to observe the moon now, I still see those same images I saw when I was six, and it pleases me to know that that part of my childhood is still embedded in me. Aw, I love that. And on that note, let me say, let's all strive to be like the moon. <laughs> yes, let's. Um, thank you for listening to this episode this week. Uh, next episode, we will continue discussing this important book as we learn firsthand what it means to be a child soldier. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting the podcast by sharing this episode with a friend via text, social media, email, however you share your favorite things. Also, visit our social media pages and uh, visit our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. Download some free listening guides, order a t-shirt, a mug, or leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you either way. Peace out. Peace out.